Sandor, or Sander Kraut, as he is affectionately known, refers to himself as a fermentation revivalist. He is the author of three books, Wild Fermentation, The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved, and The Art of Fermentation. He is passionate about spreading the word about fermentation, sharing his depth of knowledge, whilst showing how easy fermentation is it is to do. Sander writes, Fermentation makes foods more nutritious, as well as delicious. Microscopic organisms, our ancestors and allies, transform food and extend its usefulness. Fermentation is found throughout human cultures. Hundreds of medical and scientific studies confirm what folklore has always known. Fermented foods help people stay healthy. Sander has taught hundreds of workshops, demystifying fermentation, and empowering people to reclaim this important transformational process in their own kitchens. He has presented workshops worldwide at universities, farms, farmers' markets, conferences, bookstores, and community spaces. Sander Katz's website is www wildfermentation.com and he can be found on Facebook and has many, many videos on YouTube. I'm Susan, your host, and joining me on this roundtable are Bridge, Lenny, and Sibel. And today, kindly joining us for our symposium is Sander Katz, a fermentation revivalist. Welcome, Sander. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia. It is such a pleasure to be with you today. Oh, it's a delight. We've been lo really looking forward to talking to you, and we have some keen uh, fermenters here to talk with you, too. Just to get us going, could you maybe talk about how you got started in fermenting? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I would say that there were several stages to the development of my interest in fermentation. Um, uh, growing up in New York City, I always loved uh, sour pickles, and um, you know, I just always was drawn to the flavor of of lactic acid, um, and so I loved uh, uh, sour pickles and sauerkraut and things like that. Although I never made it or really was thinking about fermentation, um, you know, what 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 got me to uh, begin a practice of fermentation is that 20 years ago I moved from New York City to rural Tennessee. And I started keeping a garden for the first time. And, um, you know, at harvest time, I was faced with the pra practical reality that, you know, okay, all these cabbages are ready at the same time and all these radishes are ready at the same time. Uh, what am I going to do with it? And so, you know, that's when I recalled my love of sauerkraut and sour pickles and started uh, playing around with uh, with fermentation. And, you know, once, once I was playing in that realm of fermentation, then I got interested in uh, you know, how to make wines and other alcoholic beverages, how to make yogurt and cheeses, how to work with sourdough for making bread. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of got obsessed and started, uh, you know, exploring all the different realms of fermentation. Uh, and I have been ever since. Wow, sounds wonderful. And I can really empathize with the what do I do with all of this? <laughs> the glut every every autumn. Yes. Now, I read your book quite a while back, and one of the things that really captured my imagination was when you wrote about cultures as culture, and I wondered if you could talk about that, because I think it's so important, especially today. Um, sure. I, I mean, I think that, well, first of all, I think that it's fascinating that we use uh, use this word culture with so many different connotations. So, um, you know, the specific communities of organisms that would uh, uh, th that would transform a uh, you know raw product of agriculture into a familiar product of fermentation. Uh, you know, we call these microorganisms themselves cultures. So, you know, you can purchase yogurt cultures. You could purchase cultures for different types of cheeses. Um, you know, the packet of yeast that you buy in the supermarket could be described as a 
culture, what biologists, uh, uh, you know, cultivate in their laboratories are, 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 are cultures. Um, so we use this word culture both to describe these, um, uh, you know, microscopic communities of bacteria and fungi and also to describe, uh, you know, language, literature, music, scientific knowledge, belief systems, and really the totality of all things that people seek to pass down from generation to generation. And I, I would certainly suggest that, you know, as a group, fermented foods and beverages are are, are more than, you know, incidental culinary novelties. And, uh, you know, in, in, in several ways, they really get to... Um, uh, like the, the core of culture. I mean, at one level, I would say that, you know, agriculture would not be possible without fermentation. If people mm. didn't have some if people didn't have some clear insights into how to effectively store food from uh, the harvest uh, to feed them through the rest of the year, then it wouldn't be realistic for people to put their energy into crops that are ready at a certain moment of the year. So, you know, right there from, from the get-go, you know, agriculture, um, uh, you know, d depends upon fermentation. And then when you start looking at, um, you know, culinary traditions, people's senses of identities and how the foods that they eat fit into those, their, their sense of identity. It turns out that, you know, fermented foods are really at, at the core of that. You know, most of the, uh, you know, let's say, you know, highest expressions of different, different culinary traditions would be fermented foods. Certainly, if you look into a gourmet food store and look at the types of foods that we, um, you know, elevate onto this pedestal uh, and, and regard as special gourmet foods, almost all of them are, are products of fermentation. Um, you know, and when you, when you uh, look around the world at, um, you know, foods that, uh, you know, are invested with special uh, uh, importance or, or meaning or used to, um, you know, celebrate important holidays and rites of passage, uh, you know, frequently those are products of fermentation. So, so I think that these foods and, and beverages are very, very, um, you know, culturally important and central. Um, and the, 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 the problem is that, you know, like all aspects of food production, fermentation has largely disappeared, um, you know, out of our community and households and, uh, you know, really behind factory doors. Um, right, yeah. And at the, at the same time as it's disappeared from our lives, um, uh, you know, we've all been indoctrinated into an ideology that I would describe as the war on bacteria. It's the idea that bacteria are dangerous, bacteria should be destroyed, the only good bacteria is a dead bacteria. Um, and I think nothing illustrates this more vividly than the... Uh, than the marketing success of antibacterial soaps. Um, you know, if you if you uh, write on your package of soap, if you add a chemical and write on your package of soap that it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, that is generally regarded as a positive thing. When in fact, um, you know, really nothing could make us more vulnerable to bacteria than killing the 99.9% .9 of bacteria, uh, you know, in, on, and around our bodies that, um, you know, effectively protect us from the limited range of bacteria that can make us sick. Um, so, so I, I think that you know, uh, you know, reclaiming these foods and getting over our fear of bacteria, and um, you know, and, and working with them, uh, acknowledging that they are part of our food and part of all life, life, and certainly you know, critical to our own physiological functioning. I mean, I think that we 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 really need to sort of like reject the war on bacteria and embrace the importance of bacteria. Uh, which are really our ancestors, um, you know, and our partners in, our, in, in this life, um, uh, and embrace them uh, in a number of ways, including working with them in our food. Oh, you're just music to my ears. <laughs> There's also the thing about um, identity, cultural identity in our foods, and that gets passed down and... and as we do away with these uh, cultured foods, that seems to coincide with the loss of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say we haven't really um, uh, done away with cultured foods. I mean, you know, by, by one scholar's estimate, one third of all food that human beings put into our mouths is mm -hmm. subjected to fermentation. Um, you know, almost everyone, even, pe even people eating the most... Uh, 
um, uh, you know, processed standard American diet, you know, everybody eats products of fermentation every day, whether they're making them in their homes or whether they're being produced in a factory somewhere. Uh, you know, if you think about bread, if you think about cheese, if you think about all of the condiments that we love to put on our food. Um, so, you know, I mean, a lot of, you know, very, very mainstreamed foods are products of fermentation. Um, you know, it's just that, um, you know, the way that they're being made, the cultures are not alive when they're eating them. Right. Um, um, and, uh, you know, and, and people are, you know, in a certain amount of denial about the importance of, uh, you know, bacteria to our food, but everybody still loves fermented foods. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, and I would say actually that there has been a revival both in, um, you know, home fermentation and also in just, you know, sort of small scale local production of different types of fermented products. Yes, yes. Well, those uh, pickles you talked about in the very beginning, I hope people are making them in their home instead of buying them made in a factory. So <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, well, I I would only offer that there is something in between making it at home and having it be made in a giant factory that's sort of producing enough for, you know, half of the United States. And that is um, don't have to make every single food at home. And really a, an important part of the local food revival is uh, is an economic revival and, you know, supporting small scale businesses that are, you know, turning the raw products of agriculture into the foods and beverages actually you know enjoy um so i think that you know i mean if you can find you know a, a a local pickle maker or sauerkraut maker who is um you know fermenting vegetables uh and you know maintaining the live cultures well well that's great and if you you know if you if you can afford to buy it and don't feel like making it, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like everybody has to make everything for themselves. I mean, that's not really what I, what I, what I am counseling. Yeah. Although I think there is great power in making it um, for yourself, and I think you know, in general, we all need to sort of snap out of this idea that <laughs> primary identity is as consumers and realize, like, uh, okay, to, to to seek balance in the world, we need to be producer producers as well as consumers, and you know, this includes our food, and it doesn't mean total self sufficiency, but it means you know, making some stuff that you can share with other people. That sounds wonderful. Um, Sandra, can you elaborate on the subject of fermentation as a co-evolutionary force? You wrote that what this means is that to some degree the microbes on our food we eat determine our metabolic capacities. This is quite significant from a physiological standpoint, but it is perhaps more than that. The communication and gene transfer capacities of bacteria are fascinating and Further, the coevolution and symbiosis between bacteria and humans and plants, for that matter. This seems to be an embodiment of the connectedness that we all have to one another or our environment, um, more so even than mere physical interaction. Coevolution really is the word that um, uh, you know most accurately describes the relationship. I mean, you know, first of all, human beings, like all animals like all multicellular organisms, all plants, all fungi. Um, you know, the emerging consensus in evolutionary biologists is that, you know, all life is evolved from bacteria. Mm. Now, the corollary to that is that, you know, no other form of life ever lives without bacteria. Um, so, you know, all the other forms of life that have evolved from bacteria have interactions with bacteria that have been really, you know, with them from the very beginning. Now, in our human context, um, you know, biologists, you know, now have come to the conclusion that the cells that we each possess that reflect our own unique individual DNA genetic code are actually outnumbered 10 to 1 by mm. bacteria we are host to. So this is in a normal healthy human body, there are 10 times as many bacterial cells as there are bodily cells, uh, you know, with the individual's DNA. And these, they're not like freeloaders or, or parasites in any way. Um, you know, they, they, 
um, you know, give us a lot of our physiological capabilities. So, you know, to begin from the beginning, human beings could not effectively reproduce without lactic acid bacteria that are part of every woman's and actually women's bodies produce a glycogen, a carbohydrate that specifically supports this population of lactic acid bacteria that create an acidic condition that enables human beings to effectively reproduce. So right from the beginning, from our reproduction, we are, you know, dependent upon bacteria that, uh, you know, are co-evolved as part of the systems that each of us constitutes. Um, you know, then once you start looking at our digestion, it's bacteria that enable us to effectively digest food and assimilate nutrients. There's actually certain essential nutrients that bacteria synthesize for us within our bodies. And it, it's becoming increasingly clear that, you know, what we would call our immune function is largely mediated by bacteria in our guts and, uh, and even our brain chemistry. There's research this year suggesting that the, that, that the release of serotonin and other chemical compounds that, you know, influence how we feel and how we think are actually regulated by bacteria in our gut, you know, via mechanisms that are, you know, only very crudely recognized and understood. It is becoming increasingly clear just how centrally important bacteria are, uh, you know, to various aspects of our physiological functioning. That is so fascinating. I, I'm just, I've got to go back and reread this. There's so much to take in. Thank you. I wonder too, if you could talk about the benefit of fermented food, including both health and preservation, because that's another big issue, the preservation. I think we touched on that a little bit. Fermentation traditions evolved, emerged for various reasons in different parts of the world. I mean, the reason why, why I would say fermentation is found everywhere is that microorganisms are present in all of our food and something inevitably happens with those microorganisms as the food ages. Um, and so, you know, millennia before we were able to, uh, you know, distinguish and identify particular microorganisms, people certainly were able to identify, uh, you know, using their eyes, using their noses, using their taste buds, um, uh, you know, how food stored under different environmental conditions would age differently. And, uh, and so, you know, people would observe that under certain conditions, their food would rot into something, you know, completely unappealing that they would have to um, uh, discard in some way, um, you know, or it might be preserved, or it might become more digestible, uh, you know, or some, uh, uh, you know, off tasting compound that has a little, that, that, that has some toxicity in the food might be removed by the fermentation. So there, there are actually many practical benefits of fermentation. Preservation is certainly the most, um, uh, you know, important and widespread reason why people ferment. Well, no, actually, I should say the second most widespread. I mean, the single most widespread reason why people ferment is to create alcohol, which has been, um, you know, w which is recognized as the most ancient form of fermentation and, and is in the most widespread practice um, uh, around the world. And, you know, the production of a, of a substance that alters our, our, our consciousness, um, you know, certainly uh, uh, has been a powerful incentive for people all around the world. Um, uh, after that, I would say preservation, um, where you can take extremely perishable foods and make them into, uh, you know, foods that are much less perishable. Um, you know, think about fluid milk as compared to a block of cheddar cheese or Parmesan cheese or something like that. Um, you know, it's a combination of losing some moisture, making something drier, and also the um, acids formed by fermentation that enable that to preserve. Similarly, in a salami, you're taking, um, you know, meat, extremely perishable product, and, uh, you know, through a combination of drying, salting, and acidification through fermentation, turning it into something that is stable and can be stored, certainly sauerkraut, pickles, um, uh, yogurt, uh, you know, many different examples of fermented products you know, in, in which you know, preservation really has been the, uh, the incentive. But there are other incentives for, for fermentation. We'll, we'll, we'll return to, to health benefits um, uh, in a moment, but the, the removal of uh, toxins from food has been a very powerful incentive. And I think that the, the most um, 
dramatic example of that would be cassava um, or yucca or manioc, uh, different words for, for the same uh, a tropical tuber, a starchy tuber that in many soils develops high levels of cyanide that would kill people if they ate them in unprocessed form. The processing to remove the cyanide is a simple uh, fermentation of about three to five days. And it uh, and, and it basically, uh, 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 you know, chemically breaks the cyanide down um, uh, uh, and eliminates its toxicity. Um, so removal of toxins, um, uh, certain foods, I think tempeh is the best example where one of the practical benefits is much less uh, fuel is needed, much less cooking. If you took soybeans and cooked them till they're soft enough to eat, uh, and still they're indigestible, really. But, you know, that takes about seven hours of cooking. Uh, with tempeh, you just need to cook the beans about a half an hour at the beginning and then fry the, the finished tempeh for a few minutes at the end. So you're reducing a, a seven-hour cooking, uh, you know, process to, uh, you know, about a half an hour or 40 minutes of cooking. So, so, so there's fuel savings. But really what's getting many people interested in fermentation right now in our time are the health benefits. And let me just talk about some of the different ways ways uh, in which uh, fermentation transforms foods nutritionally. Number one, I would describe as pre-digestion. And this is the idea that, um, uh, you know, dense compound nutrients get broken down by the fermentation into simpler, more elemental compounds that can be much more easily uh, assimilated. Um, so, for instance, when you ferment soybeans, the protein, which is, you know, largely inaccessible to our human digestive systems, gets broken down before we eat it in the fermentation. It gets pre-digested and broken down into amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. And by breaking them down, those amino acids become much more bioavailable to our human digestive systems than the original protein was. Um, you know, similarly, lactose in milk gets pre-digested by fermentation. Uh, and so many people who can't tolerate the lactose in fluid milk have a fine time eating yogurt or certain cheeses uh, that have been well fermented. So pre-digestion is a really important way that, that foods get transformed by fermentation and become more bioavailable to us. Um, also, nutrients are, are, are in certain cases... Um, uh, um, uh, enhanced by the fermentation process. And, um, you know, uh, one, one nutrient that's typically found in higher concentration in fermented foods than in the raw foods you begin with are B vitamins. Um, you know, essentially the accumulation of living and or dead microbial bodies, um, uh, um, you know, increases uh, uh, the concentration of B vitamins in the food. And then there are these um, you know, what I like to describe as unique micronutrients that are, you know, th I think of them as, as, as uh, metabolic byproducts of specific organisms with specific foods. But uh, some of these unique micronutrients actually have been found to have significant benefits for humans who are consuming them. So fermented vegetables have compounds called isothiocyanates that are regarded as anti-carcinogenic, and they are metabolic byproducts of lactic acid bacteria as they digest nutrients in the vegetables. Natto, Japanese soy ferment, has a compound that has become known as natto kinase, um, which is a form of vitamin K2 uh, that is a, a metabolic byproduct of the fermentation of the soybeans by the specific organism Bacillus subtilis. And what's significant about natto kinase is that um, <clears throat> it, can, uh, it, it, it can basically uh, uh, clean out plaque accumulation in blood vessels in our bodies, which is, you know, just enormously helpful and has huge clinical application. So, so, so sometimes it's these, you know, unique metabolic byproducts that are the specific benefit of the ferments. And then finally, what I would consider to be the most uh, profound benefit of fermented foods uh, is only found in certain ferments, live culture foods. Um, uh, what we would specifically be interested in are foods fermented by lactic acid bacteria that have not been heated after their fermentation. Those are the foods that contain live lactic acid bacteria that can literally help to, you know, replenish and diversify uh, the bacteria in our gut. And, uh, you know, in the context of this war on bacteria where we have chemical exposure 
pretty much every day to antibiotic drugs, antibacterial cleansing products, chlorine in our water, all of these chemical compounds that are specifically designed to kill bacteria that we have daily contact with. Um, you know, for, for us in the 21st century, more than for people in the past, it has become important to consciously replenish and diversify bacterial uh, uh, populations in our gut. And live culture foods are an excellent way of doing this. Oh, so much information. Thank you very much, Sander. Sander, um, this We're is Lenny here. I was wondering if you have any, um, besides the nano, any specific fermented foods that work with specific illnesses. I believe that when you were talking about the plaques uh, being cleaned by the natto, that that would help with Alzheimer's, for example. Um, do you have any other uh, examples that if somebody had a particular condition, they might just say, well, gee, if I ate more of this nice fermented food, it would be helpful. As somebody who has been living with, uh, you know, with a chronic disease for, for 20 years, I have, uh, I have developed, uh, you know, quite a bit of skepticism of, uh, you know, sort of people claiming that particular diseases will be, um, uh, you know, ameliorated by specific foods. And um, I, mean, I mean, really, first of all, I need to emphasize that, like, I am not a clinician. Um, you know, for the most part, you know, uh, 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 clinical trials do not happen with real food foods because uh, it costs a lot of money to organize a clinical trial. And mostly it's people with uh, um, proprietary products, things like, um, you know, probiotic supplements um, um, based upon proprietary strains. Those are the things that get the rigorous testing. Um, what I would say is that, you know, live culture foods, um, uh, you know, as a group, and I think that the best thing you can do is eat a, a variety of different types of foods with live cultures, uh, you know, fermented vegetables, fermented dairy products, uh, you know, lightly fermented beverages. Um, you know, there's lots of different types of them. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, if you're listening to this and you consider yourself the healthiest specimen in the world and don't have any, you know, issues with your health you can benefit from live culture foods. If you've been living for decades with a chronic health condition um, and you're always looking for ways to keep yourself healthier, um, I think that your health could be uh, uh, helped by introducing live culture foods. Um, you know, if you've just been um, diagnosed with you know, with a with an acute um, uh, you know health crisis of some sort. Um, you know, I don't want to sell you live culture foods as a miracle cure, but I would suggest that um, uh, you know it's it's likely that by um, you know improving your overall digestion, your ability to assimilate nutrients, your overall immune functioning, that you could probably be helped by live culture foods and whatever other kinds of treatments you might be pursuing. Your your uh, response to that might be uh, improved by introducing live culture foods. Um, and if you're just a regular person who's, you know, feeling the effects of getting older and, you know, just wants to make sure your digestion is uh, as good as can be and your uh, immune functioning can be as, as good as can be, I would say, try live culture food. So I, I don't want to make any particular claims for any particular diseases. Like, you know, yes, there are anti-carcinogenic compounds in sauerkraut. If I was, a, or, you know, diagnosed with a brain tumor, would I just eat sauerkraut? Well, probably not. If you've been eating sauerkraut all along, maybe your likelihood of developing something like that would be, um, you know, a little bit lower. So, so anyway, I, I can't really offer any, you know, sort of particular diseases that will be cured by particular foods. I get a lot of email from people People who feel that um, the introduction of live culture foods has dramatically improved their digestive function. So people with, you know, chronic constipation, acid reflux, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, you know, lots of different types of digestive problems report dramatic improvements in their uh, in their day to day uh, uh, digestive functioning. I do hear stories about, you know, people's miracle cures, people curing counts cancers with with fermented foods, and 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 certainly I think that that's possible, but, um, you know, I don't feel that I know enough to, um, you know, say that, um, you know, sauerkraut will cure your cancer, for instance. Well, thank you. That clarifies things for me because I was kind of, you know, wondering if eating this or eating that might specifically improve something. Thank you. Hi, Sander. This is Sibel. So what makes a culture a live culture versus a not live culture? 
So, I, I mean, the, the idea of live cultures has to do with whether it has been subjected to heat after the fermentation. So, for instance, yogurt is generally subjected to heat prior to the fermentation, uh, heated even higher than uh, pasteurization temperature. When I make yogurt, I heat it to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I cool it down to about 110 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, culture it, introduce the uh, community of uh, bacteria that turn the milk into yogurt, and then I maintain it at that temperature. But then after the fermentation, I don't heat it again. And so it's live. Almost all yogurt that's manufactured in the United States has live cultures, and most of them have a like an industry seal on the container, uh, you know, vouching for the live cultures that are that are that are present in it. Uh, sauerkraut, you know, certainly sauerkraut in a can or in a plastic bag that you found it find at the supermarket has been pasteurized for shelf stability uh, most of the sort of uh, smaller local brands of sauerkraut are increasingly uh, available and on, on my website wildfermentation.com um, I have a little section where I list lots of sort of small local and regional producers of uh, fermented vegetables for the most part these are not pasteurized mostly on the packages they are loudly proclaiming the live cultures you will find inside and generally as a practical matter they are um, they are sold out of a refrigerated section um, because once they're once they're placed in a jar if they're left at room temperature, then a lot of pressure can accumulate in, in the jar as the fermentation proceeds. So, uh, so generally, these are sold out of a refrigerated section. The, the old world way of doing this was just to sell it out of a barrel. Uh, and put each, uh, you know, put each serving into a container, uh, you know, at the point of sale. Uh, and th that's still alive to a very limited degree in the United States, but mostly we're getting things that are that are prepackaged. And if they're still alive, then they're generally in the refrigerated section and generally telling you that they're still alive. That's awesome. Okay, so that's good to know. So I heard that 50% of our immune system is good flora in your gut. So have you heard something similar how does the flora affect our gut or our immune system? I don't really know how that would be quantified as 50%, but yes, absolutely. I mean, a large, uh, you know, a large amount of the, um, you know, of the function that we would call our immune function uh, is happening in our gut. I cannot tell you the mechanism of it. I mean, I would say that, you know, from, from my perusing of the, you know, sort of scientific journals, it's you know, really only in the last few years that, that there is, uh, you know, a consensus, uh, you know, that the, um, uh, you know, gut bacteria are are central to the function of our immune systems. I know that research was published this year that demonstrated that when you have an infection in your lung and your body mounts an immune response, which you know would amount to sending white blood cells to essentially you know surround, isolate, and digest away the infection, that 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 white blood cell response is mediated by bacteria in the gut. You know that's about as far as we got in 2012. Um, you know I would imagine that uh, you know in the coming years, um, you know we will have a more uh, a fuller uh, you know picture of what what's happening. But I think that you know we know very little um, uh, you know about the mechanisms of uh, you know how the gut bacteria uh, initiate this response. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sander, I know you've touched on it a little bit, but I wonder if you could maybe be more specific about what types of fermentation are available to us. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, there's different ways that, that people have categorized uh, uh, the ferments. Um, uh, you know, sometimes they're categorized by... Um, by fermentation byproducts. So you would have your lactic acid ferments, um, you know, which would include, um, you know, fermented vegetables, many types of fermented dairy products, uh, certain lightly fermented beverages. Um, then you would have your yeast ferments, and those would further divide into ferments where, where um, um, uh, the fermentation product that you're after is alcohol. And carbon dioxide is a byproduct of that. Or conversely, using the same set of organisms, uh, working with grains in breads and other types of um, uh, uh, grain ferments, um, where you have yeast, but where where uh, but but where 
carbon dioxide is actually the important uh, product and the alcohol is a byproduct that evaporates off in, in the cooking. So you have your yeast ferments, your lactic acid ferments. There are mold ferments, certain cheeses that are, that are uh, uh, made with the use of molds, um, all of the, the, the sake, um, uh, soy sauce, other kinds of uh, uh, alcoholic rice ferments um, are made using uh, molds. Asian uh, cuisines have made much greater use of molds than cuisines in other parts of the world. So you have your mold ferments, you have your alkaline ferments, uh, natto, which we were just talking about, um, a widespread group of condiments in use in West Africa use the same type of uh, bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, and these produce an alkaline product. So, so sometimes the division is made in that way. Other times the division is made by different types of substrates, substrates being, uh, you know, the food that you are beginning with. So you could separate it out as, um, you know, you have your vegetable ferments, you have your dairy ferments, you have fer your ferments based on grains. That would be everything from breads to porridges to beers. You have your, um, uh, Ferments based on legumes, things like, uh, you know, miso, soy sauce, uh, natto, tempeh. Um, but, you know, but really there is no food that cannot be fermented. Any type of food that, oh, and I, actually I left off meat and fish. Um, you know, sometimes people don't even think about meat and fish in the realm of fermentation. But, you know, our... Uh, you know, our sense of perishability has been really warped by refrigeration. I mean, you know, I have a refrigerator. I love my refrigerator. I'm dependent upon it. But, um, you know, up until, you know, 75 or 100 years ago, nobody had refrigeration. And, you know, even today, you know, most people on this earth do not possess refrigeration. And, uh, you know, given, given the concerns about, uh, you know, peak oil and the, you know, uh, the, the, the great unknown about energy futures, I mean, I don't know that it's uh, reasonable to assume that we will all always have access to refrigeration in our homes. Um, and so I think it, you know, it really behooves us to, uh, you know, not lose sight of the, um, you know, traditional wisdom uh, that people use to effectively store their food, which, you know, in most cases involved fermentation. Just totally fascinating. Uh, thank you for that. It's wonderful. You know, by, 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 uh, you know, presenting all these big categories, I'm not really getting very deeply into any of them. And, you know, if there are specific ferments that people are interested in, I would certainly recommend checking out, checking out my new book, The Art of Fermentation, that does have, you know, detailed information that could guide you through making, uh, you know, many different types of ferments. And those that I don't, I, I steer you towards more specialized forms of uh, or, or sources of information. Yes. Hi, Sander. This is Bridget. I have um, the next question, and by the way, I have your book, The Art of Fermentation. I love it. It's a fabulous amount of information. Do you have a preference in your fermentation method? I know a lot of the nourishing tradition people's, people have been pushing whey ferments, but you seem to prefer salt, but um, I know you always list all the different ways you can or things you can use for ferments, but do you have a personal preference? I never use whey in vegetable ferments. I mean, I have just to try it, but I, um, I mean, I, 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 well, first of all, I, you know, I, I don't always have whey around. Uh, second of all, I like for my, the food I make to be, uh, um, uh, broadly accessible, and there's enough people in my world who don't like to have anything to do with with milk. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't really perceive it to have any great advantage. I mean, I think that um, people have all sorts of ideas about culturing vegetables, and it's really salt and whey don't do the same thing. And like you know, if you would want to use salt and whey, you wouldn't want to use just with no salt. Uh, you you could, but you'd have something that wouldn't taste very good. And they don't do, the, the salt is not a vehicle of culturing. The salt just slows down the whole system and um, makes it more difficult for the enzymes that um, will, will uh, uh, break down the pectin, the crunchiness of the vegetables and make them really mushy. Um, so I would say, you know, you would want to use salt in any case or, you know, or not use salt, but it would really have nothing to do with the with the question of whey. Um, I don't use any, any starter. Uh, all vegetables, all raw plant material has lactic acid bacteria. And when you get them submerged, they start to ferment very quickly. 
Um, you know, there are people, uh, Sally Fallon is the primary proponent of using whey, and, and I meet lots of people who use whey. Um, you know, if you are, have a practice in your life and you are producing whey, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do with it, to add it into your ferments. You know, the only problem is that I think that, you know, I get emails all the time from people who, you know, go to the bodybuilding store and buy whey protein powder because they think they need whey to make sauerkraut and you do not. It's all on the vegetables. You know, you can buy a little powdered starter. Some people promote that. You could use some people promote uh, uh, kombucha kraut and use kombucha in their kraut. Some people promote kefir kraut. But the way people all across the Eurasian landmass have always made sauerkraut does not involve a starter. It's on the vegetables. Um, you, 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 know, you chop up the vegetables and create um, a surface area. You add salt. You spend a few minutes squeezing or pounding the vegetables to bruise them and break down some cell walls and get them to give up their juices. And when, then once they're nice and juicy, you just stuff them into a jar or a crock or whatever kind of vessel you have to work with um, and just press down enough to get the vegetables submerged under liquid and then ferment it. And you can ferment it for you know one or two days, one or two weeks, one or two months. Um, you know, it depends on how you like it, how strong the acids accumulate over time. So some people love it best after a couple of days. Some people, it takes a couple of weeks. Some people, you know, like to let it go for months and months. It depends a little bit on the temperature in a cooler space. It can ferment for a longer time because it will ferment more slowly. Um, in a warmer space, it has a more limited um, uh, horizon, but you can still make wonderful uh, uh, sauerkraut. This is a, a simple, simple food that you know billions of people eat on a daily basis, and there's no single way of making it. People do it with all sorts of different vegetables different proportions of salt and different kinds of spicing, um, uh, you know, chopped finely, chopped coarsely. Sometimes even the vegetables are left whole. And then it's just impossible to pull the juice out of the vegetables. So you have to mix up a salt water brine, uh, which dilutes the flavors a little bit more. Uh, but this is just a, a simple, simple process. Um, if you have whey, you can use whey. I never even measure the salt. And, uh, you know, I, I think that it's like any other recipe in the joy of cooking where they tell you to salt to taste. There's like, you don't have to approach this in a highly scientific way. Just add enough salt, keep tasting it, you know, start with less salt and then just uh, add a little bit of salt and keep mixing it and tasting it until it tastes right to you. And that's when you have the right amount of salt. Uh, most of the commercial manufacturers who I meet work with somewhere around one and a half percent salt by weight. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to store the ferments for long term storage? Like, is there a way to stop it when it hits a perfect stage and put it in the fridge to slow it down? Or um, do you just keep eating them as they progress and it just changes in flavor as it goes. Typically, like to eat it throughout its progression. I mean, I, I you know, sauerkraut is a successional process, or any vegetable ferment is a successional process, where you get a series of different uh, strains of bacteria coming into dominance as as it progresses and the acidity shifts. Um, and so, you know, I think that the you know the most probiotic thing you can do, the the best way to get lots of different kinds of bacteria into you, is to eat it at different stages of its development. And I also like all the different stages of its development. You know, the, the key to long-term storage for anything is a cool environment. So, um, you know, I keep my large batch in an unheated cellar and that's perfect. And I, I just, you know, dig it out as I need it and then leave a jar either on the counter or in the refrigerator if there's space. You know, if your batch gets as strong as you want it and you want to prevent it from getting any strong then move it into the refrigerator. The refrigerator, you know, is effective to help us preserve food because it is a fermentation and enzyme slowing device. Uh, the lower temperatures make these processes go more slowly. So, you know, if you taste your, your ferment and you think to yourself, I don't want it to get any stronger than this, well, then move it into the fridge. You know, if it's in a crock, 
and put it in jars and move it into the fridge, um, you know, or an unheated space that's not quite as cold as the fridge will also slow it down, but not as dramatically. Um, but, you know, the, the important thing is just to recognize that the, the, the rate of metabolism of any of these processes is directly related to the temperature. So in a warmer space, you know, in, the, in, in summertime, in a house that you keep at 75 degrees, things will go faster than they will in a cooler environment. Um, and, you know, anytime you think that they're getting as strong as you want them to be, move them to your fermentation slowing device, the refrigerator that you already have. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Sander, we have one last topic for you. <laughs> it, I think it's probably one you've heard before, but we need to address it. And that's the problem of mold and other nasties. And Bridget has another question for you. Okay, so let me address the the, the, the question of um, surface growth is, is really the issue. So the, the word fermentation, um, uh, you know, for a biologist describes um, anaerobic metabolism, the production of energy without oxygen. Now, uh, you know, in the on the ground world, there are lots of examples of ferments that actually require oxygen. But the but the, you know, technical definition of fermentation is anaerobic and certainly the fermentation of sauerkraut fits that. Uh, uh, lactic acid bacteria are anaerobic. Uh, they do not need oxygen. But unless you have some, um, you know, very uh, uh, kind of engineered vessel that can uh, uh, completely keep uh, air out, um, the surface of the ferment is the part that's vulnerable because that is the part that comes into contact with the air and where, uh, you know, oxygen dependent aerobic forms of life can develop, which include molds and they also include yeasts. And, um, you know, any kind of a, a, you know, a crock of fermenting vegetables, uh, you know, that is not engineered to keep oxygen away from the surface, um, you will eventually um, if you let it go long enough, encounter surface molds. And what people throughout the world have always done when they encounter that is scrape them off. Um, uh, you know, if you can scrape them, uh, you know, as you see them, as they are forming, you know, if they have to, if they grow less, then they will penetrate less deeply. Um, and you'll have very little effect, uh, you know, on the flavor or the texture of, of the sauerkraut. Um, so I just, uh, you know, I advise just keeping an eye on them, scraping the mold off as it forms and, um, enjoying the, the the vegetables underneath if you if you really feel put off by the mold and and by I mean, just to give you a sense of safety like this is not russian roulette um you know according to the united states department of agriculture there has never been a documented case of food poisoning stemming from fermented vegetables there are not many foods that you could say that about this food is as safe as they come even with people scraping molds off the surface. So, but, you know, if you just feel, uh, you know, sort of aesthetically, it, it grosses you out uh, to have to do that, then you should explore one of these uh, types of vessels that is engineered to protect the surface from oxygen. Uh, you know, one popular example is a German manufactured crock called Harsh, H-A-R-S-C-H. -H, and these have uh, like the lid of the, the top of the crock is a V that you can fill with water Water and essentially create a moat. And then you put the lid inside that moat. And so the, if, if uh, carbon dioxide pressure builds on the inside, it sort of burps out through that moat, but the lower pressure air and oxygen outside the crock can't get in. Uh, and then there's uh, there's some devices using um, canning jars uh, with little uh, airlocks uh, placed into the top that essentially allow for exactly the same thing, the release of pressure without allowing outside air in. I don't really use any of these um, uh, uh, devices because I am compulsively interested in smelling and tasting my crap as it develops. And if you keep on opening and smelling and tasting, you're sort of defeating the purpose of your, um, you know, clever engineered um, vessel. So I just work with, uh, you know, old timey vessels and I scrape the, scrape the mold off if I have a problem with it. Well, I've got one of those German crocs and I can say it works really good, but uh, maybe I'm not in in there um, looking at them as much as you are. So, um, Bridget, you had a question for Sander, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, 
how do you deal with the pervasive fear of, of like of botulism mostly from fermented foods because i know there's a lot of people out on the internet who start screaming if you put up a video about fermentation or something oh you're gonna kill your kids that kind of thing that's just ignorance. I, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, botulism. The reason we know the word botulism is it's associated with canning. Um, uh, botulism is. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to say it's never found in fermented foods. Uh, I mean, the, the the linguistic origins of the word botulism it comes from Latin botulus, which is a Latin word for sausages. And historically, botulism was a rare disease associated with um, fermented sausages. Uh, but, you know, but I would emphasize rare and obscure. The reason why it became sort of known to everyone is that with the advent of canning, which was just in uh, the 19, uh, the 19th century, the 1800s, canning was invented. And in canning, uh, you know, canning is sort of the di diametrical opposite of fermentation. And with canning, what you're trying to do is kill all the organisms on the food. And it so happens that uh, uh, Clostridium botulinum, the, the bacteria that produces the toxin we know as botulism. Um, Clostridium botulinum, when it's stressed by heat, goes into this sporulated form, which can survive at temperatures um, up to 250 degrees. So, uh, so boiling a food doesn't necessarily kill Clostridium botulinum. In a fermentation context, Clostridium botulinum never has a chance to develop because the, lac the lactic acid bacteria will always dominate. But if you kill off the lactic acid bacteria and most of the other bacteria, and Clostridium botulinum uh, survives and and you leave it in a perfectly uh, in a perfect vacuum, an environment with no oxygen, without uh, without high acidity. That's when Clostridium botulinum grows and becomes a problem. So, um, you know, in the early you know decades uh, uh, and years of, um, of 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 canning, uh, you know, I think that there were a lot of highly publicized um, uh, you know kind of scandalous deaths where entire families died from eating you know a can of string beans or something, um, and so. So in the popular imagination, people just, um, you know, became fearful of home preserved foods in general. And now, you know, 100 years later, we can't even remember what the fear is specifically about. We just know there's something fearful. Um, the fear is not about sauerkraut or other, you know, fermented vegetables like botulism is associated with canned foods and occasionally with improperly fermented meat or fish. But you don't have to worry at all uh, about botulism in the context of fermenting vegetables. And, uh, you know, certainly in my book and the other sources of information that I steer people uh, uh, to for information on fermenting meat and fish, um, you know, absolutely these can be done perfectly safely. We have a really clear understanding of what conditions help to create botulism and how to prevent them um, in those foods. But, you know, in most of the ferments, you know, fermenting dairy products, fermenting uh, uh, vegetables, there is no cause for any concern whatsoever about botulism. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Sander, before we um, close, could you just give us a very quick, brief explanation of how to make sauerkraut? Sauerkraut is incredibly simple, and I, I'm going to tell you the 30-second version, uh, but before I start, I'll just say that on my website, wildfermentation.com, I have a, a, you know, sort of a much more detailed version, um, so if you feel like you don't get it all listening to the 30-second version, know that at wildfermentation.com, you can find a more detailed uh, uh, explanation. So basically, it is, um, you want to chop up the vegetables. Um, you could do it with any type of vegetables, you know, Cabbages, radishes, turnips uh, are some of the really famous ones, but don't be shy about being experimental, about mixing different vegetables together, um, about spicing it. So you, you, you chop or grate your vegetables, you're creating surface area. Your most important objective in fermenting vegetables is getting the vegetables submerged under liquid and you get the strongest flavor if you can get the vegetables submerged under their own uh, uh, juices. The reason for creating surface area is for ease of pulling juices out of the vegetables. So you, you chop or grate, then uh, lightly salt, and then get in there with your clean hands and toss it all together and start squeezing the vegetables. This 
this bruises cell walls uh, and helps the vegetables uh, give up their juices. Spend, you know, five minutes squeezing vegetables until each time you pick up a handful and squeeze, it's like a sponge and water that comes out. The vegetables are really, really juicy. Then stuff them into a vessel. You could use a crock if you have one. You could just as well use a jar. A wide mouth jar works best. Uh, each pint takes about a pound of vegetables. So a quart sized jar takes about two pounds of vegetables and then just stuff them in really hard. Use a lot of force so the vegetables are submerged under their own juices. Uh, you know, in a large vessel, you might want to put uh, some sort of a weight to keep bearing down on it. In a small jar, I'll usually just uh, uh, close up the jar, but leave it on the counter because it will be creating pressure. And so every morning, I just loosen the top to release the carbon, di carbon dioxide pressure. And then just let it let it sit and ferment it in its own juices for a few days. And then just start tasting it. Taste it every couple of days. Just taste a little bit, open it up, pull a little bit out, and then press the rest of it down. And then you'll begin to experience um, uh, the spectrum of flavors. And really, some people like it best after just, you know, a couple of days of fermentation. Um, and it's certainly, uh, you know, the flavors are changing, the texture is changing, it is probiotic very quickly. Um, but but the flavors will progress over time. So so try to explore that, that succession of flavors and figure out where you like it the best. Um, you know, one of the things about buying food products is you're getting something somewhat generic, uh, you know, what the manufacturer imagines people are going to like. I sometimes uh, uh, have had the experience of serving people young sauerkraut, you know, something two or three days old and having them say, wow, I thought I didn't even like sauerkraut, but that's delicious. Um, and that's one of the great things about making this food or any other food yourself is, you know, you can figure out how you like it and make it the way you like it or the way your kids like it or the way your partner likes it. That's fabulous, Sander, fabulous. Would you share with us all your info, your website, your books, any workshops you have coming up that you'd like to talk about? Okay, let me first uh, I'll plug my web, my website, wildfermentation.com, and uh, you can buy my books on my website. You can find links to all sorts of fermentation-related resources on the World Wide Web. You can find information about, uh, about my workshops and lectures and things like that. Let me talk a little bit about my books. Um, I have three books out. My most recent book, The Art of Fermentation, is just an, an in-depth uh, exploration of, um, you know, all sorts of different fermentation processes uh, from around the world with an eye towards how you do them at home, uh, but also, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, scientific and uh, uh, anthropological, uh, you know, perspectives on, on, on fermentations uh, that people practice in, in, in different places. Um, that's The Art of Fermentation, my most recent book, and also the biggest one. It's about 500 pages, and it's a, a hardcover book. Uh, my earlier book about, wild fermenta about fermentation was called Wild Wild Fermentation that came out 10 years ago. It's shorter. It includes a lot more recipes. In, wild for, in, in Art of Fermentation, I have largely abandoned the recipe format and just, uh, you know, describe, um, uh, you know, how foods are made, different proportions, different ingredients that I've heard about people using or tried myself. Uh, so Wild Fermentation is a shorter book, uh, perhaps more introductory, and also sticks more with the recipe format. And then in between those two, I wrote a book called The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved. And it's essentially about grassroots food activism. And, you know, as I've traveled around uh, uh, the United States and other parts of the world talking to people about fermentation, um, you know, I've been inspired by, you know, different forms of grassroots food activism that I have encountered. And so the, the Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved is really about grassroots grassroots food activism that I have come across. And then also there's a, there's a DVD called Fermentation Workshop, and that's, you know, simply a, a, um, a recording of one of my uh, uh, workshops that I offered. Some people just, you know, can learn better from, you know, watching a video or something like that. Um, I also have a zine version of Wild Fermentation, which, which is what really preceded the book version of Wild Fermentation. It's even shorter and it's also cheaper and you can buy that on my website. Um, so yeah, lots of, uh, lots of different forms forms of information um, uh, available. Uh, and I am so happy to, uh, to share them. Uh, you know, fun and 
health uh, uh, supporting, uh, but I think it's also profound in ways in which it, uh, um, you know, enables us to, um, you know, have access to and relate to, uh, you know, a really magical, uh, invisible realm of transformation that is abundantly present, uh, you know, in our lives and all around us. Sandra, also, you're on Facebook, I know, and you've got some videos up on YouTube, so we'd like to direct people there for more information. And I love your website, and you list all your your upcoming workshops, which you give all over the, the U.S., correct? Lots of them come. I'm, I'm just I'm just fit, wrapping up six weeks of, uh, of vacation staying at home, and I'm about to hit the road, and uh, I'm going to be in Virginia next week at the Chesapeake Association for Sustainable Agriculture. I'll be in California a week after that. I'll be in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia a week after that. And uh, and really, like if you look on my website, wildfermentation.com, right on the home page is um, uh, you know a schedule of my upcoming workshops. And I would certainly uh, you know invite your listeners to uh, to come to any of them. Wonderful. I think they will. Um, Sandra, I have to say your breadth and depth of knowledge is absolutely astounding. And I love your enthusiasm and also your encouragement. You make it sound so easy. And I hope that uh, it will certainly help the listeners. Thank you very much on behalf of uh, Sky Blue Symposia. We're, We're very blessed to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was very inspiring. Well, great. It's my pleasure. Yes, thank you. Enjoy your day, Sander. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.